when Justin contacted me and asked if I would like to contribute to this series of books, um, I said, yes, may I have Edwards? And he said, no, you may not. <laughs> Dane Ortland already has placed his fingers all over that project. And so I said, well, I noticed that all of the others are dead guys. Can I write on a live guy? He said, yeah, who would that be? And I said, Chad Packer. Um, I, I suppose I could actually reduce the next few minutes to 15 seconds um, and say everything I need to say by declaring when I grow up, I want to be like Jim Packer. <laughs> but let me say just a few things more. Several things about this man and then a few observations about his theological contribution. First of all, if some of you are wondering why would Crossway include J.I. Packer in the list of those who deserved to have a book written about their theology of the Christian life, I would simply remind you that the readers of Christianity today identified him as second only to C.S. Lewis when it came to the most influential theological writers of the 20th century. I found that quite stunning. Second, J.I. Packer's experience in a, is a riveting testimony to the truth of Romans 8, 28. I suppose most of you know of the incident that occurred when he was only seven years old. He was chased from the schoolyard by a bully where he immediately collided in the street with an inattentive bread truck driver. The injury was severe. And to this day, Packer bears the marks of that incident in the form of a rather sizable dent or indentation in his forehead. And I, I brought this up, I didn't know you were gonna show it. You can't see it in that picture. I mean, that was probably taken 30 years ago, but um, for those of you who've seen him, it is rather noticeable. Recovery was not without its inconveniences. Uh, Packer was forced to withdraw from school for about six months. From that time until he went to university, he wore a protective aluminum plate over the injury. Uh, that was not the sort of a thing that would necessarily endear you to your peers or allow participation in athletics. And it basically reinforced his tendency to keep to himself and thrust him into a more secluded life of reading and writing. Some may wonder, could such a severe injury to the head have damaged his brain? I suggest it only stimulated its productivity. Uh, when Packer turned 11, like most boys his age, he wanted a bicycle for his birthday. Uh, but given their lingering and well-justified concerns about their son's head injury, his parents instead gave him a typewriter. <laughs> now, I know many of you are too young to know what a typewriter is. Uh, go to Wikipedia or some other um, forum on the internet and you can see what they look like. Um, to this day, notwithstanding the many technological advances that we have experienced, Packer still writes all his books on an old-fashioned typewriter. In fact, one of my prized possessions is a note, it's a, on a little note thing that says from the desk of Jim Packer, where he wrote me a thank you note for this book on a typewriter, and you can see it wasn't on a computer. Third, Packer's interest in Christianity was largely stirred by C.S. Lewis, first the screw tape letters and then mere Christianity. When he arrived at Oxford University in 1944, he paid a visit to the Oxford Intercollegiate Christian Union, also known as the OICCU. And on Sunday evening at one of these gatherings on October 22nd, 1944, following the singing of Just As I Am, Packer committed himself in faith to Jesus Christ. He was at the time standing, he said, about 100 yards away from where the great evangelist George Whitfield committed himself to Christ in 1735. Fourth, though truly born again by the Spirit, uh, Jim Packer, by his own testimony, early on struggled greatly with the power of indwelling sin. And he wasn't in the least helped in this battle by the version of Keswick theology that existed predominantly in the UK, although it has taken on a variety of different forms since then. But it was a view that one might experience a victorious Christian life only through an act of faith that led to total surrender. And this decisive moment in which one wholly yields and trusts the work of Christ within the heart 
rather than making any effort to overcome the power of sin, was, as Packer was taught, the key to Christianity. Any suggestion that a Christian should put to death the deeds of the flesh and actively and energetically seek to obey was considered legalism by these who embraced Keswick theology. Keswick theology was very unhelpful to Packer. He regarded it as deeply damaging to his spiritual growth. His increasing frustration over the inability to get past indwelling sin robbed him of the joy of his salvation. He was told what you need to do is just simply reconsecrate yourself over and over and over again until that time you could identify whatever obstacle stood in the way of the fullness of moral victory. Packer's rejection of Keswick theology came in 1944. A man by the name of C. Owen Pickard Cambridge, an Anglican clergyman, donated his library to the OICCU. And Packer, being the bookish fellow that he was, was given the responsibility of kind of collating and um, overseeing these books. He entered into the basement of a meeting hall on St. Michael Street in Oxford and there discovered, just imagine this, a set of the works of John Owen that were uncut. In other words, the pages had not been sliced as it were. He'd take a knife or a razor blade and slice each of them open. And as he was going through these volumes, he came to volume six and noticed two treatises in it entitled On Indwelling Sin and Believers and On the Mortification of Sin and Believers. It was a major watershed in his spiritual development. He devoured John Owen. And he came to understand the reality of indwelling sin and the believer's spirit-empowered battle throughout the course of one's earthly existence. And it set him free by his own testimony from the Keswick-induced discouragement of soul under which he had been laboring. The fifth thing I want to mention uh, is a little bit about his professional career. Packer took a one-year teaching post at Oak Hill Theological College in London. He taught Greek, Latin, and philosophy. And as best I know, I don't think I'm wrong in this, he never learned Hebrew. But he is masterful in Greek and Latin. Now listen to this. And if you do not salivate with envy, there's something sick in your soul. <laughs> During these years, he would go to All Souls Langham Place Church and listen to John Stott preach in the morning and at night to Westminster Chapel to listen to Lloyd-Jones. <laughs> Stott in the morning, Lloyd-Jones at night. Wow. Well, his friendship with Lloyd-Jones was launched. They launched an annual Puritan conference that focused on kind of bringing life and uh, reintroducing people to the Puritans. It convened for the first time in 1950. It met annually until 1969. I'll return in just a moment to Packer's relationship with Lloyd-Jones. He enrolled at Wycliffe Hall, Oxford. Uh, he studied theology there for about three years. He was awarded the Doctor of Philosophy degree. He was later that year ordained a deacon in the Church of England and then one year later ordained a priest as well. Following his marriage to Kit in the summer of 1954, he served as lecturer at Tyndale Hall, Bristol for about six years, and then as librarian and principal at Latimer House, Oxford for nine years. In 1970, he was appointed as principal of Tyndale Hall and became associate principal of Trinity College. And it was then in 1979, after his teaching in England that he moved permanently to Regent College, Vancouver, British Columbia, where he is to this day and about to celebrate, Lord willing, this summer, his 92nd birthday. There is no escaping the fact that Packer's life and influence was at least until he moved to Canada intertwined inextricably with that of Martin Lloyd-Jones. The defining and lamentable, lamentable moment in his relationship with Lloyd-Jones occurred on October 18th, 1966. Some of you probably know about this particular incident. The occasion was the Second National Assembly of Evangelicals organized by the Evangelical Alliance. The question they were facing, as stated by Packer's biographer, Alistair McGrath, was this, quote, should evangelicals concerned with doctrinal orthodoxy withdraw from denominations 
which publicly fail to maintain such orthodoxy, or should they try to reform them from within? Lloyd-Jones had become increasingly concerned with what he perceived to be the theological liberalism of the World Council of Churches and this penetration of liberalism into the many denominations in the UK, especially in the Church of England. And he let it be known that he thought it was time for evangelicals to come out of these denominations because in the absence of theological agreement, there just simply could be no meaningful fellowship. So in his opening address at the assembly, Lloyd-Jones issued what many, if not most, understood as an appeal for evangelicals to withdraw from their mixed denominations to form what he called a pure church that could unite around orthodox doctrine. Now, the interesting thing about this is Packer was not even present that night at the meeting. He heard about this later when somebody called him on the telephone. Stott, however, was present and was alarmed at Lloyd-Jones' appeal. He, he was fearful that impressionable young evangelicals might heed the call and pull out. And he didn't think that was a good idea. So he stood up and in essence rebuked Lloyd-Jones from the platform. The rightful and proper place of evangelicals, said Stott, is within those mainstream denominations which they could renew from within now, it's interesting, um, people have debated whether Lloyd uh, Stott's quote-unquote rebuke of uh, Lloyd-Jones was proper. Stott had second thoughts after he did it and actually apologized and asked for forgiveness from Martin Lloyd-Jones. But in any case, it prompted a crisis. It exposed a major division within evangelicalism on, on the opening day of a conference that was designed to foster Christian unity. Packer sided with Stott, a decision that not only damaged his friendship with Lloyd-Jones, but also damaged his reputation among Britain's evangelical community. Listen to Packer's own explanation for this event, and I quote, the doctor, that is Lloyd-Jones, believed that his summons to separation was a call for evangelical unity as such, and that he was not a denominationalist in any sense. In continuing to combat error, commend truth, and strengthen evangelical ministry as best I could in the Church of England, he thought I was showing myself a denominationalist and obstructing evangelical unity, besides being caught in a hopelessly compromised position. By contrast, I, Packer, believed that the claims of evangelical unity do not require ecclesiastical separation when, when the faith is not actually being denied and renewal remains possible, that the action for which the doctor called would be, in effect, the founding of a new, loose-knit, professedly undenominational denomination, and that he, rather than I, was the denominationalist for insisting that evangelicals must all belong to this grouping and no other. People take sides. They did then. They still do. Some argue that Lloyd-Jones destroyed evangelical unity. Others contend that Packer and Stott fell victim to compromise. I think they're probably both wrong in that regard, in that interpretation. But in any case, the longstanding friendship and collaboration between Packer and Lloyd-Jones suffered serious damage. You should know, however, that in spite of the adverse impact of this unfortunate split, uh, that it had on Packer, he continued to speak highly and in almost reverential terms of Lloyd-Jones. I quote, he was the greatest man I have ever known. And I am sure that there is more of him under my skin than there is of any other of my human teachers. End of quote. Packer remained in England for another 13 years. Some believe but only Packer himself knows that the events of 1966 were what prompted his decision to move to Canada. Most of you have uh, probably never met Packer or had the joy of uh, spending time in his presence. I think I can sum him up by citing the words of both Carl Truman and Timothy George. According to Truman, Packer is, quote, the classic example of a modest Christian gentleman, end of quote. Unfortunately, that can't be said of many of the so-called young, restless, reformed today. 
Timothy George's assessment of him is spot on. Quote, I have seen him buffeted by adversity and criticized unfairly, but I have never seen him sag. His smile is irrepressible and his laughter can bring light to the most somber of meetings. His love for all things human and humane shines through. His mastery of ideas and the most fitting words in which to express them is peerless. Ever impatient with shams of all kinds, his saintly character and spirituality run deep. And just one observation of my own from the times that I have been able to spend with him, the sovereignty of God's grace was far more than a theological doctrine for J.I. Packer. It has made him to be the man that he is. He is, as best I can tell, and as much as is possible this side of heaven, entirely devoid of self-promotion. The only one whom he desires to promote is Jesus. He is, in every sense of the term, the utter antithesis of the celebrity theologian or celebrity pastor. Now, just a quick word about the influences on Packer. It's interesting, it's a wide collection of individuals when asked, who has influenced you most in your theological development? He mentions Martin Luther, John Calvin, the English reformers, John Owen, Richard Baxter, Whitfield, Edwards, Spurgeon, J.C. Ryle, A.W. Pink, Martin Lloyd-Jones. Then he goes back a little farther in history. Tertullian, the Cappadocians, Augustine, Anselm, Thomas Aquinas, and the Oxford Inklings. So you can tell he was a widely read and well-educated man. He did say this, quote, my pneumatology, that is his theology of the Holy Spirit, Enriched, to be sure, by Edwards on revivals and by interaction with charismatics is still essentially that of John Owen. And though current needs have led me to say much about the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, crucified and risen, who is my Lord and Savior, my life and my hope, still stands at the center of my horizon, which surely is how it should always be for all of us. My overall theological outlook has seen small adjustments, but no major changes. And I thank God for the gift of consistency in holding to the things I first embraced and embrace today as his revealed truth. In fact, uh, in a private interview, Packer was asked, what in your theology has changed over all these years? And he said, and I'm quoting, my theology has no doubt broadened its base since 1947, but apart from getting clear on particular redemption, in 1953 or 1954, and again, due to his having read Owen's treatise, The Death of Death and the Death of Christ, I don't think there's been any change in its structure, method, or conclusions. Like Calvin, I was blessed in getting things basically right from the start. <laughs> um, one of the things among many for which I especially admire Packer is um, all theological reflection, in his opinion, has to issue in holiness of life. Um, theology and spirituality are inseparable for Packer. In fact, when you read his writings, they are peppered throughout with hymns and um, incredible prayers. Um, he was truly a man devoted to spiritual theology. He said, one way of judging the quality of theologies is to see what sort of devotion they produced. Now, one final observation about the man and then a few comments about his theology. Although Packer did not use the phrase, he was a thoroughgoing Christian hedonist. As you could tell from Michael's comments, so too was Spurgeon. And we see this in the book that John mentioned earlier, Hot Tub Religion. When searching for an image or a metaphor or an analogy to summarize the approach of so many to Christianity today, Packer landed on the experience of sitting in a hot tub. Now, block out from your mind the image of J.I. Packer in a hot tub <laughs> and just listen to what he said as he described his own experience. This is one of the, the, the best paragraphs he ever wrote. He said, the experience, quote, is the perfect symbol of the modern root in religion. The hot tub experience is sensuous, relaxing, floppy, laid back. Not in any way demanding, whether intellectually or otherwise, but very, very nice. Even to the point of being great fun. 
Many today want Christianity to be like that and labor to make it so. To this end, many are already offering occasions which we are meant to feel are the next best thing to a hot tub, namely happy gatherings, free from care, real fun times for all. And thus when modern Western man turns to religion, if he does, most don't, what he wants is total tickling relaxation, the sense of being at once soothed, supported, and effortlessly invigorated. In short, hot tub religion. <laughs> I love that. But you must understand Packer is no killjoy. He repeatedly insists that happiness plays an essential role in Christian experience. He says real enjoyment is integral to real godliness. But it comes, he says, from basking in the knowledge of the redeeming love of the Father and the Son and showing actively loyal gratitude for it. You love God and you find yourself happy in him. Your active attempts to please God funnel the pleasures of his peace into your heart. And so what he advocates is genuine joy, not hot tub pleasures. Clearly, um, he resists the sort of happiness or pleasure that comes from egocentricity, which he defines as, quote, unwillingness to see oneself as existing for the creator's pleasure and instead establishing oneself as the center of everything. The quest for one's own pleasure in some shape or form is the rule and driving force of the egocentric life. Jesus, on the other hand, demands self-denial, that is self-negation as a necessary condition of discipleship. Now, he doesn't say that as if picking up your cross and denying yourself rules out pleasure. It is, in fact, the pathway to pleasure. He says what is to be negated is not personal self or one's existence as a rational and responsible human being. Jesus does not plan to turn us into zombies, nor does he ask us to volunteer for robot role. The required denial is of carnal self, the egocentric self-deifying urge with which we are born and which dominates us so ruinously in our natural state. Like the good Christian hedonist that he is, Packer understands the foundational biblical truth that our joy in God is suspended on God's joy in God. In fact, I remember the first time I came across um, this quote in Hot Tub Religion. I couldn't tell if it was Packer echoing Piper or if Piper is an echo of Packer, but it doesn't really matter. Here is what he said, quote, if it is right for man to have the glory of God as his goal, can it be wrong for God to have the same goal? If man can have no higher purpose than God's glory, how can God? If it is wrong for man to seek a lesser end than this, it would be wrong for God too. The reason it cannot be right for man to live for himself as if he were God is because he is not God. However, it cannot be wrong for God to seek his own glory simply because he is God. Those who insist that God should not seek his glory in all things are really asking that he cease to be God. And there is no greater blasphemy than to will God out of existence. Now, just rather quickly, a few key elements um, in Packer's theology of the Christian life. He repeatedly insists that the central reference point for everything entailed in Christian living is Christ quote, self-offering, blood-shedding, ransom, peacemaking, propitiation, and penal substitution on behalf of sinners. Penal substitution, said Packer, I quote, is the mainspring of all the believer's joy, peace, and praise, both for now and eternity. As far as Packer is concerned, without penal substitutionary atonement, there is no Christianity. He goes so far to suggest, quote, that if the penal character of Christ's death be denied, the right conclusion to draw is that God has never justified any sinner nor ever will. And if you have not read much in Packer and you want to be challenged and fed theologically, read his article, What Did the Cross Achieve? The Logic of Penal Substitution. A second observation. We should all be forever indebted to Packer's defense of biblical inerrancy when people have wanted to cast it aside and do away with the term. I remember coming across his justification for believing inerrancy, not simply because the Bible itself taught it, but also because, as he said, authority belongs to truth and truth only. I can make no sense, says Packer, no reverent sense anyway, of the idea sometimes met 
that God speaks his truth to us in and through false statements by biblical writers. That's profound. Think about the implications. His belief in the functional authority of Scripture, that the authority of the Bible wasn't just an abstract theorem, but it actually served to, to govern what we believe and how we behave, was manifest particularly in June 2002. The Synod of the Anglican Diocese of New Westminster in Canada, of which Packer was a member, authorized its bishop to perform so-called same-sex marriages. And at the official gathering of the synod, Packer, together with several like-minded evangelical Anglicans, stood up and walked out. In an intriguing article that he wrote entitled, Why I Walked, he said this, because this decision taken in its context falsifies the gospel of Christ, abandons the authority of scripture, jeopardizes the salvation of fellow human beings and betrays the church in its God appointed role as the bastion and bulwark of divine truth. My primary authority said Packer is a Bible writer named Paul. For many decades now, I've asked myself at every turn of my theological road, would Paul be with me in this? What would he say if he were in my shoes? I have never dared to offer a view on anything that I did not have good reason to think he would endorse. The decision of the Synod, wrote Packer in a concluding statement, quote, involves the delusion of looking to God, actually asking God to sanctify sin by blessing what he condemns. This is irresponsible, irreverent, indeed blasphemous, and utterly unacceptable as church policy. How could I do it? That's why he walked. Third, one struggles to think of anyone since J.C. Ryle and his classic work, Holiness, who has articulated more clearly than J.I. Packer, a biblical vision for personal godliness. Packer's known for a lot. You've probably read Fundamentalism in the Word of God. Most of you, Evangelism in the Sovereignty of God. As John mentioned, his vision of the 16th century, the 16th, 17th century Puritans and, and bringing them back into the life of evangelicalism, things for which he's known. I personally think that his greatest accomplishment is his understanding of Christian holiness. Holiness, he said, is the calling of every Christian, must never be regarded as an optional add-on. It is a sign and expression of the reality of one's faith and repentance and of one's acceptance of God's ultimate purpose and is genuinely necessary. Listen to that. Is genuinely necessary for one's final salvation. And by the way, it, it's probably one of his least known books, but I think it may be one of his very best his book, Rediscovering Holiness. And if you can get a copy of it, I strongly urge you to do so. Fourth, and I've got, got two points and then I'll stop. I want to say something about Packer's theology of the Holy Spirit. Packer is certainly not what we would understand as a charismatic, but he is not unsympathetic to the concerns and focus of charismatic Christians like myself. Unlike so many who speak of charismatic expressions with cynicism and disdain, Packer has consistently displayed a commendable openness in recognizing both the presence of God and the practical value of certain of its emphases. He is a model of Christian charity and it reflects his desire to maintain as much as is possible unity in the body of Christ. I want you to listen to what he says. I'll let you make application either to yourself or to others as you feel led. He responds to those who are offended by charismatic phenomena with the observation, quote, that we are very apt to react by abusing the whole movement and denying that there is anything of God in it at all. How silly, how nasty. This is a reaction of wounded pride and willful prejudice and as such is bad thinking in every way. End of quote. Now again, Packer did not overlook or dismiss the extremes in certain segments of the charismatic world. But he does go on to say, quote, that if charismatics err, and he believes they do, 
They err only by expecting to receive from God whose face they seek more than he has actually promised. When one examines the fruit of the movement by biblical standards, says Packer, and I quote, it becomes plain that God is in it. Just one little um, anecdotal uh, add on here. Many of you may not know the name of John Wimber. John Wimber died in 1997. He was generally recognized as the founder and the leader of the Association of Vineyard Churches. Uh, I can still remember in the 1990s, I, I told him I thought that he was probably the single most criticized Christian in America and he just smiled. He said, well, that's probably true. But I can still remember him, John telling me in private conversation of an incident with J.I. Packer. I don't know when it was, it must have been somewhere in the early to mid 90s. Uh, Christianity Today convened a forum. And I don't remember all who were present, but I do remember that Charles Ryrie of Dallas Theological Seminary, my former professor, uh, was present. Kenneth Conser, um, Packer, and Wimber. And there may have been one or two others. And John, with a big smile on his face, said, I'll never forget that as the conversation became increasingly heated and criticism was virtually directed all in my direction, that J.I. Packer got up from his chair and came over and sat down next to me and put his arm around me in the midst of that rather difficult discussion. Not as a way of endorsing everything that Wimber believed because they did have their theological differences, but as a way of expressing his love for a Christian brother and to affirm him in so many very deep and personal ways. Lastly, if I've learned anything about Packer in my study of him and my friendship, it is that he was and is an unrelenting realist when it comes to the Christian life. Unreality in religion, he says, is an accursed thing. Unreality toward God is the wasting disease of much modern Christianity. We need God to make us realists about both ourselves and him. And I think you see this most clearly in his own personal battle with indwelling sin. Packer will not tolerate any idealized notion of the Christian life in which the believer, whether through a second blessing or a passive yielding in faith, is assured of deliverance this side of heaven from the daily battle with the world, the flesh, and the devil. His realism is also seen most clearly in his approach to suffering. Whatever form our pain, frustration, and disappointment may take, says Packer, the New Testament is consistent and emphatic in viewing such experiences as the natural condition of Christians and churches as long as they are in this world. Suffering, he says, is the Christian's road home. There are no detours around the anguish and heartache of living in a fallen and corrupt world. A life free from pain and trouble is portrayed by some in the West, he says, as virtually a natural human right. And Christian minds have been so swamped by this thinking that nowadays any pain and loss in the Christian's life is felt to cast doubt on God's goodness. It is a grievous mistake, said, Papper, said Packer on numerous occasions, to imagine, quote, that the good for which God works is our unbroken ease and comfort. God's goal is rather our sanctification and Christ-likeness, the true holiness that is the highway to happiness. Constant ease and comfort, therefore, are not to be expected. Yet Christians may nonetheless derive constant contentment from their knowledge that God is making everything that happens to them a means of furthering and realizing the glorious destiny that is theirs. Few in our day, although he never wrote a book directly addressing it, but few in our day have spoken with such biblical clarity and realism in response to the so-called health and wealth gospel. But we mustn't think that Packer's realism is a grim perspective that breeds only gloom and grief, far from it. He has consistently spoken of our earthly sojourn as one filled with joy inexpressible and transcendent peace that flows freely from the love of God and the grace of the cross. The believer's joy is in the assurance that no matter how battered and beaten he may be in this life, nothing can separate him from the love of God in Christ. The believer's triumph 
isn't around or by way of escape from trials, but in the promise of God's abiding presence through them as the Lord leads and loves us when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these great individuals that you have brought to our attention down through the course of history. Great because they realized not their greatness, but yours. Individuals who would say with John the Baptist, he must increase, I must decrease. Father, I thank you for the life of Jim Packer. I thank you for um, that so-called accident which was so gloriously orchestrated by your good providence at the age of seven that thrust him into a life of reading and reflection and intellectual pursuits. Where would we be today were it not for that schoolyard bully and that inattentive bread truck driver? We thank you, notwithstanding the anguish that young Jim Packer felt and experienced. I'm sure that he looks back on that day and that moment as an expression of your loving providence and your preparation of him for the ministry which he's had these many, many decades. Father, we want to pray for him right now. Increasing frailty, approaching his 92nd birthday, failed eyesight, unable to read or write much. But Lord, I know that um, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ through the power of the indwelling spirit is so vibrant in this man. Though his body is wasting away, his inner man, as Paul says, is being renewed day by day as he looks not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. Because those unseen things Those invisible things on which we set our gaze are eternal. So, Lord, we pray you would comfort him and encourage him and his wife, Kit, that you would be an ever-present comfort and help. Lord, however many more years you may choose to give him, we thank you for this man. We thank you for his life. We thank you for the lives of all of these individuals whom we have come to love and from whom we have learned so much. And insofar as they imitate Christ, may we imitate them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.